Thank you, Rachel. Um, hello, my name is Elise Grozer. I'm a PhD candidate, as uh, was just said, at the University of Cambridge. Um, the presentation has a rather dramatic uh, title and picture. Let me just tell you that this is a photograph from my living room in Mexico City. Um, Mexico is a very uh, interesting case for uh, inequality study, especially Mexico City, because it has the richest man in the world living there, so it has uh, arguably one of the highest levels of inequality in the world. Um, that's where I live when I'm not in Cambridge, so uh, forgive me if my examples are a bit biased sometimes towards the Mexican case. Besides that, my uh, analysis is on world inequality. I'll tell you what I mean by that in a second. Um, the main point maybe that I'd like to make is that uh, if we measure inequality but not know where it actually lies within the income distribution, it's very, very difficult to um, improve its levels. So I think that we should, or I argue for having something like a poverty line for inequality as well, an inequality line, a threshold, a cutoff number. Um, if we know below which or above which level inequality should be, it's easier to target it and to address it. I'll uh, show you some data that I think supports this case. Um, right. I created some kind of a roadmap that we should follow. Um, that's closely related to the paper that, uh, that I handed in. It's not chronologically the same, but you'll uh, follow the, the, the content is very similar. First, they say that to address inequality effectively, we need to know where to locate it, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, because inequality is mostly located on a world level in the extremes of the distribution that is in the top and the bottom parts, and mostly uh, in the top part. I'll show you the data for that. The indicators that we use to measure inequality, and that's mostly the Gini today, uh, are not able to detect these changes in the tails sufficiently, which means that we might underestimate inequality, or depending on what kind of inequality we want to measure, we might not get it right. Um, and that is a problem in trying to ameliorate it so I think that if we make explicit the actual concentration at the very top and we offer, for example, a threshold of maximum inequality, like an inequality line, um, that could help to curb inequality. So this is what I want to do in the last part, um, presenting an alternative measure. It's called the Palma Volume 2. I'll tell you why. Just before I move into the actual paper, some concepts. Um, I look at world income inequality, and that's the shares that different parts of the population hold in uh, income, so it's relative inequality. Um, in this paper, I compare income inequality in two different, with two different data sets. The first one is Milanovic's uh, World Income Development with the benchmark 2000, uh, 2008, sorry, um, because it disaggregates data for the top 5%, so the top ventile. Uh, or for five percentage uh, groups throughout the population. Um, I use that data set because it has 116 countries compared. That's over 90% of population and GDP, so it roughly approximates uh, world uh, dynamics. And then I use a subsample of 41 countries uh, from the LIST database that disaggregates data to the top 1% of the income population. Um, there are some methodological problems about that. We can discuss about that later if you want. Um, uh, but it's the largest sample that's available to uh, disaggregate top 1% income earners. Um, I also uh, use some uh, part of the paper to look at distribution over time. I will not go into so much detail here because uh, of time limitations, but uh, we can discuss that later as well. Uh, and that's for a subsample of 25 countries. Okay, so where is... Um, inequality located in the actual distribution across countries. Turns out that inequality is mostly defined in the extremes of the distribution um, because the population parts between the fifth decile and the ninth decile hold roughly 50% of uh, total income throughout the countries in the world. And I'll show you a graph in a second um, where we can see that. Um, that's a quite curious uh, discovery that Gabriel Palma, Cambridge uh, professor, made some years ago, 
Um, it's very stable over, over time as well to some degree, and uh, especially across countries. So <coughs> the differences in the level secured by the top uh, ventile, top 5% of the population, range from almost 39% of total income in South Africa to 11.5% in Slovenia. So differences are vast. Um, Slovenia uh, has the top 5% owning less than a third of what the top 5% in South Africa owns. Um, and the bottom 40% of the population is quite similar. Uh, so in South Africa, for example, 5.5% of total income goes to the bottom 40% of the distribution, uh, while in Slovenia, which is the most equal country according to most measures, um, it's 25.5%. So it's five times that. Um, and this contrasts very much with the relative homogeneity in the upper middle groups, where the difference for the 55% of the middle uh, are 20% uh, of income difference between China, which own, has the largest uh, upper middle group, uh, and the Central African Republic, which has the lowest. Um, okay, so to understand this better, I show you the graph. The blue part uh, is the share of the bottom 40% of the population, uh, and you have the 116 countries uh, lined up. So you can see that there is some difference in uh, the blue part. There's especially large difference in the upper, the yellow and the green parts, which is the top 10% of the distribution um, of, of income earners. The red part in the middle, that's uh, the middle of 50%. It's really fairly stable across countries. Um, so that's the one very interesting aspect. The second very interesting as aspect is in the lower part. You have the inversion of the, um, of the distribution. You see that while the yellow part is the 19th ventile, so it's not the top 5%, but the next 5%, is incredibly stable across countries. It's almost the same. Um, where really the difference lies is in the green part, which is the top 5% of income earners. So it's very, very different uh, from the more equal countries to the left towards the more unequal ones uh, to the right. Different way of looking at this, more explicit, um, is this graph where you have the 19th ventile, which is, um, or ventile, which is the yellow line, is very, very stable across countries, and the uh, blue and the green lines is the ten, top 10 and top 5% respectively, um, move along a very similar pattern. And this indicates that most of the inequality within the top share is defined by uh, the top 5% rather than the top uh, 10%. So although the top 10% is uh, very unequal, or, or because it is very unequal, um, we can see that even within this decile there is large inequality and the top part of the top decile is uh, much more unequal than, or is much uh, richer proportionally than the rest. Um, another measure, I don't have data or I don't have a graph for this now, um, but the top decile has the highest genie if you compare different deciles, uh, genies with each other. So what happens if we look at smaller ranges, top 1%? Mm, I'm not sure you can see it until the back, but the, the dark line, the blue line, is the top 1% of income earners um, for a set of uh, 41 countries. And you can see that the range is from 3.1%, again in Slovenia, versus 13.5% of uh, total income in Colombia. So you have the top five countries are, well, except for South Africa, which is in the top always, uh, is Latin American countries, and that's quite expected. However, what is less expected is that if you look at the middle, here you have oh, this one. That's Belgium, actually. So according to this um, ranking, some countries that we traditionally expect that are much more equal all of a sudden are fairly high up in the ranking. You have in the middle here, you have Denmark, here you have Finland, this one is Finland. Um, you have other Scandinavian countries around here. So if we rank countries according to the top 1% of the, of the share their population holds, the 
dynamics or the ranking changes um, compared to the, to the Gini coefficient. I'll tell you in a second why this is very interesting and problematic. This is, as I said, the development of um, inequality over time. I know it's very small. It's not so essential uh, for you to see all the details. It's just to show you that there are some divergent uh, experiences between countries. So it's not as clear. It's not that in all countries it's falling or, or rising. However, uh, in most uh, countries, the top share is rising, um, as we can see in this graph. The blue line is the top 1% around 1990, not exactly the same year, but roughly 15 years of difference minimum is between the two measurements. Um, data is very limited for this kind of uh, study, so um, these are the only countries that have comparable data over time from the LIST data set. Um, as I said, the top 1% in blue is around 1990, and the top 1% share in red is around 2010. So we can see that in most countries the top 1% share is actually uh, increasing. Um, I know uh, Minister Neri gave a very optimistic presentation uh, in the morning about Brazil and uh, I'm very happy about the Brazilian case. Unfortunately it's not the same in all countries and maybe I'm a bit more uh, skeptical. Um, but from this data we can see that even though there is important exceptions like the Mexican case, um, the lowest which saw a large decrease uh, in the share of the top 1%. Also, it was very, very high. So um, there is some, some reason for optimism, but uh, in most countries, uh, the top share is increasing. OK, so why, why is this a problem, and why can we not measure this properly? Um, if we look at the development of the Gini coefficient over time in the Mexican case, because that's the one I know best, we can see that from around the 60s to 2012, the latest year for which there's information, the line is almost stable. So that would mean that there was very little development in inequality. Um, if we look at different indicators, and here I use the Palma, we can see that there is very large movements, it's the red line. So there has been a lot of things going on in the income distribution. The Palma, what it measures, I'm not sure whether you're familiar with it, is the ratio of the top 10% over the bottom 40%, and there's good reasons to use that as an indicator that are explained by uh, Professor Palma or by Cobham and Sumner in their papers last year. You can look at them. Uh, you can ask me about that later, but I'll not go into details uh, about why this is a preferable measure. Um, besides the fact that it does capture changes in the extremes of the distribution, which is why it doesn't look as flat as the uh, Gini curve here. Um, since I, well, from the data that I just showed you, there is uh, large differences in the extremes. If we want to measure inequality properly, we should look at the extremes and we should have an indicator that can uh, display changes in the extremes. So the Palma is a, an, an interesting proposal compared to uh, the Gini if we're interested in uh, measures at the top. Um, most people are, in fact, interested in what happens in concentration at the top and bottom rather than at smaller changes in the middle, for which the Gini is uh, more uh, adequate. So an example, besides the Mexican case, to not make it too biased, um, of the problems of using the Gini to measure concentration is that, for instance, Portugal and Sierra Leone both have a Gini of 34.4 in 2010. If we use the Palma measure, for example, to... Uh, capture inequality, it uh, becomes 1.38 for Portugal and 1.73 for Sierra Leone, which means that there's 20 position ranks between the two countries. So it becomes a very, very different picture. Um, to understand what it means that Palma becomes uh, 138 or 173, um, I'll tell you what it actually measures. It measures the share of income that the top 10% hold compared to the bottom percent. So if it's over one, it means that the top 10% own more in total income than the bottom 40% of the top population. Um, in most countries, actually, uh, they do. So to come back to this graph, because I only told you half of it in the last slide, um, 
we can see that it's counterintuitive that Belgium or Denmark or other Scandinavian countries are in the middle of the, of the income ranking rather than at the bottom where we usually locate them with the, the Gini coefficient. And this is uh, explained by the difference in the shares of uh, top 5% income, which is the red one, or top 10% of income earners uh, with the share they hold. Thank you. If we now measure inequality according to the share of the top 10%, we will get a different ranking uh, than if we measure it according to the top 1%. So yes, the Palma is an improvement over the Gini, um, but it's probably not enough if we want to look at the very high concentration uh, at the very top, um, especially for countries with high inequality like the Latin American ones, which expectedly are in the top, but also if we care about concentration in uh, high-income, uh, low-inequality countries, according to the Gini. So an alternative that uh, I propose in the paper is uh, Palma Volume 2, or Volume 3, which is the share of, or the, the ratio of the top 5% share to the bottom 40, or the top 1% share of the, uh, over the bottom 40. You can see that they behave somewhat differently. This is the Volume 3, the red one is the Volume 2, and the blue one uh, is the conventional Palma, you can see that South Africa is a bit off the chart because its inequality is too high. Um, but especially in the middle range, the top 1% uh, measure gives very different results than do the, the traditional indicators. If we had the Gini here, it would have a completely different uh, measurement as well. So um, if we care about the concentration at the very top, there is a case for using uh, ratios that can display and can uh, capture inequalities at the very top uh, better. They're more explicit about that and they're more intuitive in the calculation than the Gini. Um, maybe you were wondering how much is too much since that was the title of uh, the paper. Of course, we're not going to an ethical discussion which is very related to um, cultural and uh, country preferences and uh, needs to be uh, on an idios idiosyncratic uh, discussion in each country. But the virtue of the Palma Volume 2 that I calculated for the global, uh, for, for, not for the global distribution, for the international distribution, so uh, across countries, is that on a global level it's uh, one, the measure. That means that top 5% own as much as the bottom 40% uh, in share. And that is a very easy threshold for technical reasons if we want, not for uh, ethical reasons, but we can probably argue that more than, um, th if the top 5% own more share than the bottom 40%, that could really be uh, too much. So um, if we look at the actual countries and the, the differences between their incomes, it's, um, the, the Palma volume two is 0.45 times of the income of the uh, lower parts in Slovenia. In South Africa, it's just over five, over seven, sorry. Uh, so that means that the top 5% in South Africa own 56 times the share of total income that a person in the bottom 40% uh, can hope to have. So that's really absurd difference uh, and absurd inequality. Um, so might be too much. I'll not go into details with policy making as a result to change inequality, but this is kind of the plus part. Um, but of course it's not enough to just fix an indicator and a threshold. We need uh, to go into policy. I'll just quickly point your attention to the fact that inequality um, market-based in Mexico and in Denmark, for example, which is a much more equal country according to the Gini, according to the 1% depends, uh, is fairly, fairly similar in 2010. However, the market income, uh, sorry, the, the disposable income is very different. So obviously the importance uh, lies in policy making. This is a very good news um, because that means that actually something can be done about inequality. But to do that, um, I argue that it is important to have a threshold to know um, what we have to actually target. So the conclusions that I derived from the, the data that I found is that the income concentration at the top is not only higher than expected, but uh, it also depends on the indicators that you use 
uh, inequality becomes much higher than expected in different countries. Um, these levels are unlikely to be in the interest of the majority of people, so it's definitely too much. We need an indicator that is explicit about uh, this too much, so that explicitly states the concentration at the top. Um, the PAMA is an alternative to that, is to be complemented with other measures, um, but we definitely need to fix an objective to know what we actually want to approach, much like the extreme poverty lines, um, to have an extreme inequality line that we know we don't want to uh, overstep. This is not the only, but definitely the first step to go towards an inequality that we'd prefer to have rather than the one we have. Um, thank you.